Queer Methods of Travel in Curious Corners of the World by the Honorable O. P. Austin from the National Geographic Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Queer Methods of Travel in Curious Corners of the World by the Honorable O. P. Austin from the National Geographic Magazine. Volume 18, Number 11, November 1907. No feature of tropical or oriental life more impresses the traveller from the temperate zone Occident than the methods of travel and transportation which greet him at every hand. Whether it be upon the mountains or tablelands of Mexico and Central America, the Cordilleras or Plateaus of South America, the islands of the Caribbean, the deserts or jungles of Africa, the sandy wastes of Arabia and the Holy Land, the densely populated plains of India, the mountain passes of Tibet, the jungles of Siam, the islands and watercourses of the Philippines, the crowded cities and highways of China, the rugged hills and narrow valleys of Korea, or the coastal cities and mountainous interior of Japan, the methods by which man travels and man's requirements are transported, are ever strange, ever changing, ever fascinating. To the man or woman who has been accustomed to travel by the comfortable methods of our own country, a marked contrast is found in the borough of Mexico, the llama of South America, the sledges of Madeira, the saddle ox of Central Africa, the camel of the desert, the donkey of North Africa and Arabia, the bullock cart and the dandy of India, the yak of Tibet, the trotting ox of Ceylon, the elephant of Siam, the carabao of the Philippines, the wheelbarrow and sedan chair of China, the pack bull and palanquin of Korea, and the jinriksha and kago of Japan. From the moment the traveller leaves the temperate zone countries of the Occident and plunges into the tropics of the Orient, he finds as a poor substitute for that noble animal the horse, the donkey, the llama, the camel, the elephant, the ox, the carabao, and finally man, in those densely populated sections where labour is cheap and land cannot be spared to support animals for transportation. Of the one hundred million horses known to exist in the world, eighty millions, or four-fifths of the entire number, are found in the temperate zone and nearly all among Occidental people, while the remaining twenty millions, scattered through the tropics, are largely employed in the service of temperate zone visitors or residents, and are but feeble representatives of that animal as he is known to the people of Europe or America. In the United States and Canada, we have one horse for every three and a half persons. In South America, one for every seven. In Mexico, one for every twelve. In Japan, one for every thirty-three. In Turkey, one for every forty. In the Philippines, one for every fifty. In Africa, approximately one for every one hundred fifty. In India and southern China, one for every two hundred. The comparative absence of the horse in the tropics is due chiefly to climactic conditions, and in the Orient to the fact that the density of population prohibits the utilization of land for the production of his food. In his place we have, therefore, scattered through the tropical and oriental countries of the world, approximately three million camels, ten million donkeys, and twenty million buffaloes or carabao and everywhere that horses are not available, the patient, slow-moving ox. The llama will carry from fifty to two hundred pounds, a man from seventy-five to a hundred fifty pounds, the donkey one hundred sixty to two hundred pounds, an ox one hundred fifty to two hundred pounds, a horse from two hundred to two hundred fifty pounds, the camel from three hundred fifty to five hundred pounds, the elephant from eighteen hundred to twenty five hundred pounds. With the scarcity of animal power in the tropics and the Orient, man has devised many methods for travel and transportation, and in many cases has, perforce, put his own shoulder to the wheel or his own neck under the yoke, and made himself a burden-bearer and the transporter of not only merchandise, but in some cases of his fellow-man. 
I confess to you that until I had visited these countries and seen these things with my own eyes, I could scarcely realize that the conditions which I had seen pictured were those of the present day. But now that I have seen them in actual existence in this twentieth century, I begin to realize the great disadvantage under which tropical and oriental man has labored in his attempts to develop exploration, intercommunication, and exchange of products, and the great benefits to him, and to geography, to science, and to commerce, which would come from some satisfactory device which would do for the tropics and the orient what the horse has done for the temperate zone occident. Our line of march in observing these peculiar conditions will take us around the world, plunging first into the Spanish-American tropics, thence to western and northern Africa, thence for a short tour through southern Europe, thence via the Holy Land to India, Tibet, the Malaysian Peninsula, Java, the Philippines, China, Korea, Japan, and returning via northeastern Siberia and our own Alaska. At our very first stop in Mexico, we encounter the burro, the Spanish term for the animal which we usually know as the donkey. The statistical records indicate the existence of about ten million of these diminutive and patient burden-bearing animals scattered over the world, chiefly in Spanish America, Northern Africa, Arabia, and the Holy Land. Originally domesticated in the Holy Land in Egypt, he was carried to northern Spain by the Mohammedans, and thence to America by the Spanish explorers and colonizers. While much used in Spanish-American countries, he is less prized and less cared for than in his usual home of western Asia and northern Africa, where he is the constant companion of man, returning a reasonable care with faithful service and evident affection for his master. They are used not only on the mountain roads, where they are more sure-footed than the horse, but also in the towns and cities, the horses in these more populous centers being reserved for the transportation of people. For transportation over the country roads or in the mountains, they are assembled in considerable numbers and march singly, following their leader in a long file known as the pack train. They travel a distance from ten to twenty miles per day, according to conditions of roads, carrying of from one hundred to two hundred pounds each, and, accompanied by their masters in the curious costumes of Spanish America, present a picturesque appearance as they wind in long trains through the valleys filled with tropical verdure. In many of the mountain sections these pack trains are the only methods yet available for the transportation of ore from the mines to the smelting works or the seaboard. Further south, in the mountain ranges of South America, where the great altitude and difficult travelling requires an animal especially prepared by nature for these peculiar conditions, the llama is still used in limited numbers as a beast of burden. The llama was the only animal suited for transportation found in America by the Spanish discoverers and explorers, the horse, the donkey, and the ox, which now perform most of the work, having been brought originally from Europe. The llama belongs to the camel family, having the same peculiar foot with a divided hoof and cushions placed on the under surface, thus making it especially valuable for mountain climbing and on sandy plains, and having also many of the peculiar habits which characterize the camel. In all parts of that great line of deserts stretching from North Africa across Central Asia to Northwest China, the camel is everywhere in evidence, the total number of the world being estimated at about three millions. Here, in the midst of these great waterless areas, we see the camel in all the varied types and in the variety of methods of his utilization. How valuable this strange and always weary-looking beast is to the people of North Africa and Central Asia can scarcely be realized until you see him, as I have, actually performing his service, and realize that he is the only beast of burden able to endure the long marches across the desert. Costing about as much as a good horse, his speed is equally great, his life considerably longer, and his ability to carry a load equal to that of three horses, while the fact that he can travel for a week, or if necessary, nearly two weeks without water, renders him invaluable to those great sandy stretches. 
he can also go for several days with little or no food subsisting meantime upon the fat stored in the humps on his back which nature seems to have provided as a storehouse for sustenance in case of absence of food not only is the camel a valuable freight carrier but he serves as the travelling car of the rockefellers the carnegies the morgans and the harrimans of the desert when he is chosen for this more pretentious service a light framework is placed upon his back and covered with claws to screen the occupants from the sun and the observation of the passers and decorated with pompons of varied colours in this gorgeous compartment which may not be inaptly termed the palace car of the desert the master of the camel train places his wife and children his choicest merchandise his cooking utensils and daily requirements and travels in state the observed of all observers the envy of the wandering native of the desert from africa we pass to that curious section of southwest france known as the landes consisting of some five thousand square miles of flat and sandy marshes the inhabitants are chiefly engaged in cattle raising the peculiar condition of the soil composed chiefly of sand and marsh makes travel by the usual process difficult and so the shepherds go about on stilts in some parts of this formerly uninhabitable region the lands are being rescued from the drifting sands by the planting of trees and in other places are being developed by drainage and so while the number of inhabitants is increasing the number of stilts required is growing less of course we could scarcely omit the belgian dog-cart in this discussion of queer transportation methods for while the use of the dog for labour is gradually being abandoned in most other countries the belgians still cling to the custom one of the queer transportation methods which modern civilization has furnished is the single rail railway which runs from eberfeld to barmen germany carrying its passengers and freight in cars suspended from wheels which run on a single rail supported by a framework and operated by electricity generated many miles from the place at which it is applied to the propulsion of the cars nor could we in this discussion of queer transportation methods pass venice that city without a single horse i am not sure that this description of venice as an absolutely horseless city is literally true though i was solemnly assured while there that there was not a single horse in the city but certainly there are but very few if any and the horse on their streets would be quite as great a novelty to the venetians as a gondola on the potomac would be to us in washington in the holy land the donkey is in evidence everywhere and furnishes the chief method of transportation his availability for application to all kinds of transportation whether for people or merchandise coupled with his small cost and limited requirements for food render him especially valuable to the people of this section we now bid adieu to the donkey and the camel and will review some other curious methods which still prevail on the rivers which flowed past the garden of eden on the euphrates and the tigris are still retained the curious water transports of centuries ago the raft of skins and the circular boats these rafts are sustained by inflated skins prepared for this especial purpose and after the raft floats down the river to its destination the inflated skins are removed the air permitted to escape and the skins carefully folded and carried back to the upper waters where they are again inflated and used as the support of another and still another raft even more curious to the eyes of the traveller from other parts of the world are the circular boats made of wicker work and covered with skins or made water tight with pitch which are still in daily use on the tigris and euphrates rivers these curious little vessels are used for the transportation of both passengers and freight and the skill with which they are managed by those accustomed to their use is quite surprising and interesting just how they get animals in and out of these curious vessels seems a little puzzling though it is probably no more difficult than the methods by which cattle and horses are lifted from a lighter and deposited in the hold of the modern steel steamer no feature of life in india is more striking than that of the methods of transportation 
from the moment you put foot on the land you find a bewildering variety of vehicles most of them drawn by the humped ox known in our zoological gardens and menageries as the sacred ox the elephant is still used to some extent in india burma and siam though in these regions in which roads have been developed his place has been taken by the ox and other methods less expensive the large quantities of food required by the elephant make him available only in the comparatively underdeveloped sections where heavy work is required in handling timber or in the military service his ability to carry heavy loads however still leads to his use in certain sections for he can easily carry a ton at a single trip and maintain a speed of about four miles an hour in a climate in which horses are comparatively useless the method of conveyance by a pole supported on the shoulders of men is very common throughout india and is known as the dandy from india onward we find an increasing use of man for the transportation of both merchandise and people due chiefly to the cheapness of labor and the density of population which precludes the use of land for producing food for animals in ceylon we get our first glimpse of the jinriksha which competes with the famous trotting oxen of the island the trotting ox is trained to fast travelling and when attached to light carts and driven by experienced men makes a speed which is quite marvellous in ceylon we also see for the first time the peculiar boat with outriggers which is found in various forms among our samoan philippine and hawaiian neighbours the boat is very narrow and is steadied by the long outrigger to which is attached a pole which rests on the surface of the water i well remember my first experience in riding in one of these narrow boats from the dock at colombo to the steamer lying off in the harbour and i must admit that i had a better opinion of the boat and the boatman after this practical test than i had before another type of boat in use in the philippines has double outriggers one set at each side these boats are found in the waters of practically all parts of the philippines and of our pacific islands on page seven hundred one is an illustration of that useful animal the caribou or water buffalo which forms so important a factor in the agriculture and transportation of the extreme orient originating in india the caribou has been transported westward as far as egypt and eastward through the malayan peninsula china indochina and the islands of the indian archipelago the number among the oriental people is estimated at fully twenty millions and you will find them in greater or less numbers all the way from egypt to china costing it about one half as much as an ordinary horse they perform all the services usually required of that animal and their extreme deliberation in movement is compensated for in the fact that they can endure the heat of the tropics while their fondness for water and mud renders them especially useful in the flooded rice fields and on the muddy roads during the rainy season they are used in every way that the horse is used in the temperate zone attached to sleds to carts to drays in the cities to carriages and as saddle animals their thick brown skin almost devoid of hair gives little heed to the whip yet they are docile patient friendly with the natives but unfriendly to the white man and of great service to the filipino both on the farms and the roads in the towns and cities you see them everywhere drawing heavy loads on carts and drays standing patiently in the broiling sun if they can but have an opportunity once or twice a day to wallow in the water and mud of some nearby stream without an occasional opportunity to submerge themselves in water they soon become unmanageable and even dangerous to those about them while their chief service is for the agricultural work and the hauling of heavy loads they are sometimes attached to carriages where horses or ponies are not available and this is not infrequently the case for the number of horses and ponies in the islands is but about a hundred fifty thousand while the number of carabao is nearly one million there is no speed limit for the carabao carriage one of the common methods of transporting water in the philippines is given on page seven hundred three 
the long bamboo pole carried on the shoulder of this girl is filled with water the bamboo is prepared for this service by punching out the sheets of light material which divides it into sections at the joints in china we find less of animal transportation and much more performed by manpower and this is especially true of southern and central china at the north where the climate is that of the temperate zone and the population less dense there are horses though in small numbers as compared with similar conditions in the occident the street scenes on page seven hundred six show the various methods utilized in the coast cities and in the interior we have here the jinriksha pulled by men the wheelbarrow and the coolie porter the coolie porter is seen everywhere carrying loads of from one hundred fifty to two hundred pounds divided between the two ends of the bamboo pole stepping briskly along the street or road chanting a curious sort of cry which he imagines helps him to more readily endure the fatigue of his burden the three principal methods of transportation of people in central and southern china are the sedan chair the gin rickshaw and the wheelbarrow the sedan chair gets its name from the fact that it is modelled after a type once used by the aristocracy of the city of sedan france they are much used in Hong Kong because the steepness of the mountain side on which most of the foreign residents live make the use of the gin rickshaw extremely difficult. In the narrow streets of the native quarters of the great cities, they are the only available method for transportation of people, except that of the wheelbarrow, and in the crowded sections it is only with the greatest difficulty and by the aid of the warning shouts of the bearers of the chair or the runner who precedes them that the mass of humanity is induced to give space for its passage the more excessive type and that most affected by the wealthy and exclusive of the chinese are enclosed with lattice work and while the open type is more convenient for sight-seeing those having the screen at the sides and rear have their advantages in the crowded native quarters since the occupant is partially screened from view and less liable to have his progress interrupted by the crowd of curious natives which always gathers at the sight of an american or european traveller in the native quarters even in these however the traveller is not always free from observation for it was while riding in a chair of this general type that the german minister baron von kettler was attacked and killed during the boxer riots in pekin the sensation of riding in a sedan chair is not an especially agreeable one it is placed on the ground for the passenger to enter the coolies take their places at the end of the poles and at a signal given by a man in the rear the chair is lifted until the poles rest on the shoulders of the men then they start off at a quick pace winding their way through the crowds jostling shouting halting and again starting as the crowd gives way and unless they keep step which they seldom do the swaying teetering motion imparted to the chair by the long flexible poles on which it rests is anything but agreeable to the inexperienced probably more freight and more passengers are transported in china by the wheelbarrow than by any other land method the wheelbarrow there used differs from that used by us in the fact that the wheel is set in the centre and thus supports practically the entire load while the handles are supported in part by a strap or rope over the shoulders of the man who operates it as a result the wheelbarrow coolie in china will transport nearly a half ton on his vehicle wheelbarrows are much used in the country where the roads are but little developed and it is said that passengers sometimes make the entire trip from shanghai to pekin a distance of six hundred miles by barrow a two-passenger barrow will make about twenty miles per day and the coolie is content with a pay of about twenty cents per day or an average of about one-half a cent per mile for each passenger or about one-fourth of the low passenger rate recently fixed for the railroads by several of the states of this country yet i presume most of us would prefer to pay the two cent rate in a comfortable passenger coach than the one half cent rate on the wheelbarrow on the level well kept streets of the foreign quarters of such cities as hong kong shanghai and pekin the wheelbarrow coolie will struggle along with a load of six or even eight people 
Other strange methods of transportation in China are the junks, sampans, houseboats, and river crafts, which crowd the rivers, harbors, and canals of that densely populated empire. Many of them have peculiar marks, resembling an eye, painted on either side of their bows, which I found on inquiry were really intended to represent eyes, and were invented in the firm belief that they actually aid the vessel in finding its way. The junks and sampans are the freight carriers along the coast and in the harbors. Houseboats are found everywhere, but especially in the waters adjacent to the great cities, and it is estimated that several millions of the people of China have no other home than these floating residences. They are supplied with the simple requirements for cooking and daily life of the home, the pigsty at the rear, the tiny flower garden in the front or upon the roof, and are often sculled from place to place by the mother, with her children playing about her and her youngest strapped upon her back. I have often seen these Chinese and Japanese boatwomen sculling their boats about the harbors, halting at the sides of vessels and clamoring for employment, meantime hushing the cries of the babies on their backs by a peculiar shuffling, swinging motion of the body as they scull the boat or shout their offers of service. In Korea, the bull, the donkey, and the chair coolie vie with each other as burden bearers, though the donkey is more reserved for long distance travel in the mountainous regions. The chairs are not unlike the palanquin of India or the sedan chair of China. In most cases, they are carried by straps or ropes attached to the ends of poles and passing over the shoulders of the coolies. Official chairs are usually carried by four and sometimes eight porters and are by far the most comfortable method of travel in Korea. A team of good coolies will take you over the country at the rate of four miles per hour, sixteen hours at a stretch, thus enabling you to make over sixty miles in a single day, provided you are willing to endure your share of the fatigue by sitting cross-legged in the box for that length of time. Japan is said to be the home of the jinriksha, which it is claimed was invented by an ingenious American missionary. Whatever may be the true story of its nativity, it is no longer peculiar to that country, for you see it everywhere along the Asiatic coast, from Ceylon eastward to Vladivostok. While the gin rickshaw is the popular mode of conveyance in the coast cities and on the level country roads of Japan, it will not serve in the mountains, which abound in every part of the interior. There its place is taken by the kago, which is quite similar to the dandy of India. Even in the most occidental of all the oriental cities, Yokohama, where contact with western methods has induced the adoption of many of our customs, manpower is still the principal factor in transportation. As we leave Japan our steamer must be again cold, for Japan furnishes the chief coal supply of the Orient at the present time. The coal is brought alongside the vessel in open barges. A series of platforms built out at the side of the vessel, each one about four feet higher and three feet narrower than the one next below, looking like a big flight of steps up the side of the vessel. Then a Japanese man or woman is stationed on each of these steps, and a lot of men and women in the barge below, and supplied with scores of small baskets, holding not to exceed a half bushel each. These they fill with the coal, and they are passed by hand, one at a time, to the person stationed on the first of the platforms, and he passes them, one by one, up to the person on the platform next above him. Thus, hour after hour, a steady stream, or perhaps several streams, of these baskets flows up the side of the ship, passed from hand to hand, men and women working together indiscriminately, and emptying barge after barge, until the vessel has received its requisite supply. But it is a slow method at the best, and I well remember the experience of lying for two days in a broiling sun, just off Shimonoseki, waiting for a multitude of Japanese men and women to perform a service which might have been performed in an hour by the appliances in use in the United States. Here a great crane, operated by steam or electricity, picks up a car carrying perhaps fifty tons of coal, and pours its contents gently into the hold of the steamer lying alongside. The picture of the mail carriers in Alaska, on page 710, 
illustrates the extent to which the reindeer has become a factor in the life of that section, due to the foresight and energy of Dr. Sheldon Jackson. And now, as we return home to our land of the horse, the trolley car, the railroad, and the horseless road vehicle, and contrast our own conditions of travel and transportation with those of the tropics and the orient, I want to suggest the possibility of the extension of certain of our transportation methods to those countries, and the development of prosperity which may result. Clearly the conditions of transportation in the tropics and the orient are due in part at least to the absence of that noble animal which has so served us in the temperate zone occident, the horse. He has rendered possible the development of Europe and America by transporting the product of the farm, the mine, and the factory to the common carriers, the ocean, the river, the canal, and the railway, and to the sections thus developed has come great prosperity. In the tropics, where the horse cannot endure the climate, and in the densely populated Orient, where land cannot be spared to supply him with food, the facilities for transportation to a common carrier are inadequate. The common carrier is therefore not provided, and there is sluggishness, lack of production for exchange, lack of commerce, lack of prosperity. True, rivers do exist in these countries, and railroads can be built. But if they lack some satisfactory means of transporting the natural products from the place of production to that common carrier, the carrier will not be supplied, the farm will not be developed, the mine will not be opened, the factory will not be built, and that prosperity which comes from a ready market for products cannot prevail. As a result, the horseless areas of the world have remained undeveloped and unprosperous, while the area supplied with the horse has developed and become extremely prosperous. Now comes the final question, whether the ingenuity of man has provided any substitute for the horse, which can be utilized in those areas where the horse cannot exist because of climatic conditions, or lack of space for the production of his food. To this question I think I may answer in the affirmative. For many years man has been experimenting in attempts to transport merchandise and men by some machine which carries within itself its own propelling power. He learned a century ago that he could do this on the water by the steamship. Then he soon learned that he could drive a wheeled vehicle on land by power produced within itself, provided he supplied it with an iron or steel track on which its wheels might run, and with this knowledge the railroad spread over all of that part of the world where horses could be found to bring the product to their stations. But until the beginning of the twentieth century, man had not solved the problem of operating self-propelling vehicles on ordinary dirt roads, or across stretches of country in which no roads exist. But that art has at last been attained. The introduction of the bicycle brought the rubber tire, and the application of the rubber tire brought a self-propelled vehicle which could be operated on country roads, the automobile. Then came the development of the freight motor, which could carry heavy loads of merchandise over the ordinary highways, and even over sections where no roads exist, and today thousands of horseless vehicles are moving hundreds of thousands of tons of merchandise over roads of a type which can be supplied everywhere, in the tropics or the orient, as well as in the temperate zone or the occident. Auto Trucks the possibility and practicability of applying the self-propelling vehicle to the transportation of merchandise and people in deserts, in the tropics and the orient, has already suggested itself, and the experiments have made already assured success. In the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona, motors are successfully carrying freights in a temperature of from 120 to 140 degrees in the sun, where, owing to the extreme heat, Horses or mules can only be used at night. In Nevada, a single motor truck is now performing the work of 30 horses, carrying freight over 100 miles of mountain roads. In California, a train of motor cars is carrying over dirt roads in the mountain regions as much ore at each trip as would require 200 pack horses for its transportation. In Puerto Rico, a line of three motor vehicles, established to carry passengers and mails, 
performs the work for which more than a score of vehicles and over one hundred horses had been required. Numbers of American motor vehicles for carrying heavy loads have been put on the roads of Cuba and Santo Domingo with success, and more are being ordered. In Honduras, motor trucks are conveying minerals to the seaboard from the mines one hundred miles inland, a single motor performing in one day as much work as could be performed by one hundred mules in the same time. In South America, the horseless vehicle is carrying passengers and freights to the inland cities over roads where only a donkey was utilized, and doing so at an enormous saving of time and expense. In Egypt, the freight and passenger motor is beginning to take the place of the camel. Hundreds of horseless vehicles are in operation, some of them over long stretches of desert, and roads are being constructed through the desert, on which the product of certain mines will be brought to market. In Turkey, motor cars are making regular trips over country roads, carrying both freight and passengers. In India, motor cars are being imported at the rate of nearly two million dollars worth per annum and put in service on the country roads, as well as in the cities and towns. A company has been organized to manufacture motor cars, and our Consul General reports that the Indian government is considering the desirability of utilizing motor transport wagons for moving the products of the out-of-the-way districts to market. Special Agent Christ reports to the Department of Commerce and Labor a rapidly increasing use of the horseless vehicle in South Africa especially in the mining regions, that trains of freight wagons are now being hauled by steam motors over stretches of country where no roads exist, and that the cost of constructing motor roads where they are required is only about one-eighth as much as that of railroads. In the Congo, the Belgian government is constructing hundreds of miles of road for the use of the motor, which is to be applied to the transportation of freights. In Java, an American horseless vehicle is now being used for the transportation of mails over the country roads. In Japan, the experiments with the horseless vehicles have been so successful that a company has recently been organized to build and operate horseless vehicles for a general transportation service to Tokyo, and thence to the surrounding towns. In the Philippines, a line of motors is about being put in to carry passengers on certain country roads, pending the completion of the railway, for which contracts have recently been let. A special type of vehicle, made in Paris, has now trains of horseless freight and passenger trucks operating in France, Belgium, Germany, Turkey, Serbia, Bulgaria, Algeria, Central Africa, Chile, and Peru. And finally, so confident are those acquainted with the horseless vehicle and its ability to operate in the tropics and the Orient, that a race of motor vehicles from Pekin, China, to Paris, France, a distance of 9,000 miles across the desert and through countries in which the camel is now the chief carrier, has actually taken place more than a score of vehicles having entered the race. Horseless vehicles may be operated by steam, by gasoline, by alcohol, or by electricity, and the material with which to supply this power is available in tropical as well as temperate zone countries. Today, great steamships are running from Borneo in the tropics to the ports of Western Europe, traveling a distance of 12,000 miles without a single stop, with power generated by liquid fuel drawn from the oil fields of Borneo while in practically every section of the tropics except the deserts are available millions of horsepower in its waterfalls which may now be utilized since man has at last learned to transmit that power from the place of production by wire and utilize it for operation of railways trolley roads and even horseless vehicles i know that the query which will arise in your minds will be how can you successfully and profitably operate horseless freight vehicles in countries where there are no roads, as is the case generally in the tropics and the Orient? To this I reply that if the freight-carrying vehicle is supplied, the roads will be constructed. A hundred years ago the roads of England were so bad that it took two days and three nights of incessant travel to go from Manchester to Glasgow and at the beginning of the last century the time required for a trip over the bad roads from philadelphia to baltimore was often five days 
or as long as it now takes to cross the continent the fine roads of europe and whatever we have of good roads in the united states have come chiefly in the last century in answer to popular requirements the feasibility of making and maintaining good roads in the tropics is shown by the fact that india which had no wagon roads when england assumed control in that country is now noted for its fine and well-kept roads aggregating nearly two hundred thousand miles in length give to the tropics and the orient a vehicle which will do what the horse does in the temperate zone occident and the plentiful supply of cheap labor in those countries will make road building a mere incident of the development which will certainly follow the tropics and the orient are the great undeveloped sections of the world within the tropics are millions of square miles of productive land and billions of dollars worth of products for which the temperate zones are calling in the orient are hundreds of millions of patient workers and for their products the occident is increasing its demands the inability of each of these sections to respond to our demands has been because of the absence of some available method of transportation given this facility in the form of the self-propelled vehicle and with it a reasonable supply of temperate zone energy and capital and we shall see those countries develop the iron horse extending his domain further and further into the interior and coming nearer and nearer to the door of every man and with it an increased exchange of products which will develop commerce geographical knowledge and general good fellowship between the people of all nations and all lands end of queer methods of travel by the honorable o p austin from the national geographic magazine